One of the most difficult parts of playing a chess game is coming up with plans that actually work in the middle game. You can blitz out your opening theory and get your king to safety, but in a quiet position with no clear targets or tactics, you're often left asking, what am I supposed to do now? In this video, we're going to be using some advice that you may have heard before, which is to improve your worst placed piece. I'll give you a checklist to help determine which pieces are badly placed in a position, and then we'll go through some real examples from intermediate level games. Hopefully this will give you some ideas when you're not sure how to make progress in a relatively slow position. So let's start off by running through our checklist to help you determine which of your pieces and your opponent's pieces are bad in a particular position. And this does go in order, so we'll start at the top and then work our way down as we go through these examples. So first of all, we have pieces that are under attack. Second, there are pieces that are undeveloped. Third, pieces that are undefended. And then finally, pieces that are unhelpful. So let's run through our checklist by first looking at this position. Um, let's first look at the white pieces. So which of white's pieces is the worst placed piece? Well, going down our checklist, we first have any pieces that are under attack. So which of white's pieces are under attack? This should be pretty self-explanatory with this move a6. Um, we put this bishop under attack and there are no tactics in the position. So we will either need to take or move back. So there's no reason to go any further. Obviously, this is white's worst placed piece. And so in the game, white moved back. So now let's take a look at our checklist with the black pieces. So starting off, do we have any pieces under attack? That should be with a quick scan. Nope, we don't. If the bishop does take here, we can take back and it will be an equal trade. Do we have any pieces that are undeveloped? Well, both of these rooks are still on their starting squares. Of course, this rook has been castled, but it hasn't moved since being castled. And then in terms of minor pieces, we also have this bishop here on f8 that also has not moved from its starting position. So I would say in terms of bad pieces, this is probably our worst piece. However, looking at the position as a whole, I can see that we have our queen lined up with white's king. And so actually, instead of moving this piece out, a better kind of developing move um, would be to line up the rook along this same file so that we can create some opportunities for tactics and um, create threats that white's going to have to defend against before we move this piece out and connect our two rooks. One other thing to notice about this position is that going through the checklist can help us to create tactical targets in the position. So looking at white's pieces again, when this bishop moved back, this became number three, an undefended piece. And so this can be a target as it became later in the game. So this was a blitz game. I did end up playing this move to create some threats against the king. Um, white moved the queen out and just a couple of moves later, this blunder allowed for a trade and then suddenly a double attack. In fact, kind of a triple attack because we're opening up this attack on the undefended bishop over here. This knight moves up to attack the queen. And when white thought they were defending against both these threats and moved back to defend the bishop, uh-oh, we forgot about the one threat that can end the game in one move and my opponent got checkmated. So you can see going through this checklist helped us to create a good plan in this little bit of a sharper middle game and looking at our both our bad pieces and our opponent's bad pieces helped us to create threats that ultimately won the game very quickly with some tactics. So let's take a look at this next example. So we're again playing with the black pieces and going down our list, we don't have any pieces that are under attack. Um, we do have two minor pieces here that are undeveloped and all of our major pieces are also on their starting squares. So we have some work to do. So going a little further down the list and thinking a bit in advance, um, we can pretty quickly determine that our light squared bishop here is going to be a pretty unhelpful piece in this position. First of all, because it's just going to be really difficult to get it developed. Um, if we want to try and go here, this pawn is going to have to move and that's not happening anytime soon. And if we want to try and fianchetto it over here, well then this gives white the tempo and the opportunity to move this knight out, open up an attack on our rook, and we'll end up having to push some pawns and it will just really hamper our development over here. So pushing this pawn is not really an option even though we're trying to develop our pieces. With this in mind, you'll notice that white's light squared bishop is an absolute monster on this diagonal. And what would be really nice is if we could trade our bad light squared bishop for white's really good one. Um, so how can we go about doing that? What is a plan that we could come up with to both develop our pieces and also offer that kind of a trade? 
So we could very simply try to get our bishop to the c6 square by first going here and then here. And if white decides to move the knight and open up for the bishop, well, we can continue with our plan. And even if white decides to take with the knight, now suddenly we have our knight out, we're all developed, and white is most likely not going to trade its best piece for our knight over here. Even though it does triple the pawns, this opens up some weaknesses over on the king side. And these tripled pawns, they look kind of funky, but they're actually really nice along these open files. They control a lot of space. We can put a rook over here on b8 and just have some really nice control over on this side of the board. Stockfish is evaluating this as equal and even a little bit better for black if white makes the wrong move. And the only move to maintain that equal position is bishop d5, um, in which case we can kick it back. And this bishop just really has nothing to do here. Th this is a completely fine position, definitely very playable. Uh, for both sides, there are some targets over here along the side of the board, and again, our pawns are just doing a really nice job of controlling everything. So it's good to think all the way through the trades, and again, go through the checklist to see if you can trade one of your bad pieces for one of your opponent's good pieces. That's a really great plan that you can pretty quickly put into effect. Let's go into our next example. We're playing with the white pieces here. And this is a pretty common situation, at least in the kinds of openings I tend to get, where there's a bunch of tension in the center and it's really difficult to know when you should make certain trades and when you should release that tension. So black just played bishop d7 and you may have immediately been thinking to take with this knight, snag the bishop pair, and you know, life will be good. Um, but this is actually not a great move in this position and let's use our checklist to understand why. So in general, in a closed position like this, and this is a closed position because both sides still have eight pawns on the board and these center pawns are really locked down. And so this is the kind of position where it's a lot more of a maneuvering type of game and it's not so sharp and tactical. The bishops don't have their wide open lines. And so it's generally better to keep your knights in these kinds of positions because they can jump around between multiple colors, jump over the pawns, and they just have a lot more range. So even without that rule, we can pretty quickly see that this bishop is just a bad piece for black. It just does not have anywhere to go. It can go back to the back rank, but that doesn't seem very helpful. Um, and even after this knight moves, it only has a few squares over here to play with. And it's really just being held back by the same colored pawns as the bishop is sitting on. In contrast, our knight is really nicely placed here. It is on our opponent's side of the board. It's controlling a lot of space in our opponent's camp and we can even refill with another knight in the event that we get captured we can jump back in and regain control of this important e5 square for as long as possible so there is really no situation where we would want to trade this really good piece for our opponent's really bad piece this bishop is really just getting in black's way it's causing them to have to maneuver around it and it's making the position feel really cramped and so if we were to relieve that tension by trading here this would make our opponent's life a lot easier. So it's much better to slowly improve the position. Again, going down the checklist, we do have some pieces that are undeveloped. So we can potentially start with this move or move our queen up and then move our rooks in where potential pawn breaks will be. That's kind of the plan that I would have going forward in this position. All right, let's take a look at our final position. This is probably the most challenging one we'll be looking at. There are a lot of winning moves but it's really important, I think, to have a long-term plan so that you understand which of your pieces are the most valuable and how you want to be maneuvering them in this super closed position. Okay, so we're playing with the white pieces here and let's see if we can figure out which of white's pieces is the worst placed in this position. So first of all, do we have any pieces that are under attack? Nope, everything looks fine. Any that are undeveloped? All of our pieces are developed. Um, with the exception of this rook, which hasn't moved since castling, but I actually like the position of this rook because it has the option to do a rook lift. And this queen is still on her starting square, but she can pretty quickly move up or even over here and make a beeline over to the king side if needed. Now, do we have any pieces that are undefended? Well, yes, we do have this bishop, which is not defended by anything. It's not really in danger of being attacked, so I wouldn't say this is like an extremely pressing issue, but it is one to keep in mind. Um, honestly, I think a good move might be to go up here just to both create the threat of making some kind of battery over on this side of the board and also to defend this bishop in the event that some pawn breakthroughs happen and it's suddenly in danger. But again, this is a very closed down position, so I'm not super worried about this bishop. So let's see if we can find which of our minor pieces is the most unhelpful in this position. So 
again, your eyes might be drawn to this bishop because it's kind of an overgrown pawn. It's just staring at the backs of these two pawns. But actually this bishop is doing quite the important job because in the event of any pawn breaks along these diagonals, this bishop will be really helpful in controlling the dark squares. And so I actually really like the placement of this bishop and I'd like to leave it there as long as possible. So what about our light square bishop? So I said before that in these kinds of closed positions that the knights tend to be better than the bishops. There's really no opportunities for trades anytime soon, but this piece will actually probably be the more useful of our bishops because all of our pawns are on the dark squares. And so eventually this bishop will be able to maneuver um, around our pawns and potentially, you know, sneak in for attacks on the opponent's pawns, which are all on the light squares. So I'm actually fine with keeping this bishop. It could also potentially help with pawn break like here. So I think this piece is okay. So I would consider the d3 knight probably our best placed piece. It is controlling a lot of key squares and it's also threatening to jump onto this outpost square here on c5. The problem is we can't do that immediately because we would be captured and then the pawns would start to break up in the center and that's not quite what we want to happen quite yet. In contrast, I think this knight is probably our most unhelpful piece. It can't really move forward. It's just not really doing much, but what would be really nice is if it could support this jump to this outpost square, which would be kind of a short-term plan that I'm thinking. So how can we do that? Well, since the position's so closed down, we do have time for a knight reroute. So that might look something like going back here. Let's just say black does nothing. Obviously in a real game, this most likely won't happen, but just to illustrate the point, we can reroute our knight all the way back so that it can support this jump into an outpost square. And controlling an outpost is honestly a solid plan in and of itself, especially in these slow kind of maneuvering positions, just improving the placement of your pieces. Um, and again, using this checklist can help you come up with these kinds of plans. Thanks so much for watching. I hope this helps you as you continue to improve your middle game strategy. I will be making more videos on specifically middle game concepts. So if there's any in particular you'd like to see, please let me know. And don't forget to subscribe. It helps me out a lot. I'll see you soon.